Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this, what is now a virtual seminar. Uh, our apologies that the snow got in the way and we were unable to have this in person. Um, welcome to this um, seminar hosted by Ankar Rao and NOAA GSL. Um, both organizations are core contributors to the Developmental Testbed Center, which provides support for the MetPlus verification and diagnostic system, which is kind of at the core of our, um, our visitors' interest. Um, so Nick Loveday is from the um, Australian Bureau of Meteorology and has attended AMS this past week in Denver and then has had a brief visit in Boulder over the past few days. Um, He's here on behalf of his colleagues at the Bureau who are working on adopting MetPlus to complement their current verification capability called Jive. Nick joined the Bureau as an operational meteorologist in 2015. He worked in the Darwin Forecast Center uh, for several years, producing severe thunderstorm, aviation, wildfire, marine, tropical cyclone, and public weather forecasts and warnings. Um, over um, the more recent years, he has worked as a verification scientist and Python developer working on the Jive verification system. He now works at, um, at the Bureau's Melbourne Center um, within the verification area. Um, Nick has an interest in understanding the future role of meteorologists and how verification can be used to help streamline the forecast process. He is also interested in verification technology and methods. Um, his seminar today will detail some of his work as well as the Jive system. Um, we will be taking questions um, via Slido. Um, and I'm wondering if um, either Brett or um, Jenny would like to um, just run through briefly how, how the Slido will work. I see that below on the on the web, on the webcast, if you kind of scroll below, you should be able to add your name and a question and it will be picked up by the Slido. Excellent. Thank you, Jenny. So um, with that, uh, Nick, um, why don't we let you take it away and um, talk about Jive verification system as well as um, the work you've done in heat wave warning verification. Thanks, Nick. Yep, sure. Can you hear me fine? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I'm Nick Loveday. And um, so I'm based in Australia with the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, Tara's already given me a nice um, intro, but uh, to highlight, if you're curious where Darwin is, it's up the very top of Australia. So I worked um, six years at the Bureau office there, um, but now I'm based in, in Melbourne. And yeah, um, as Tara mentioned, my background is originally in operational meteorology. Um, I'm now a verification scientist, but um, I'm really interested in the, in the overlap of those two fields, which is kind of I've been working on over the last few years. So there's two parts to this seminar. Um, the, the first part will be around um, our verification system that we've built and um, just some, um, I'll highlight some nice examples of um, just the impact that verification has had on the Bureau. And then um, I'll probably pause there and, and take some questions after um, I finish part one. And then in part two, I'm going to introduce a new verification score that we've um, created and then um, show some results of how I applied that um, score to do, um, to verify our, our new heat wave warning service. So to begin with, um, a bit of background um, with the forecast process in Australia, it's probably um, somewhat similar to, to in the US. Uh, we start with our observations that feed into our physical NWP models. Then um, we have statistical post-processing. These forecasts then feed into the graphical forecast editor. Um, so this is um, GFE, which is similar to, to what the NWS use. Um, I think we, we borrowed their GFE version, um, the code from their GFE version maybe over a decade ago and then kind of developed it into our own system. This is a tool that allows uh, meteorologists to do um, edits um, with, with, to, to the gridded forecast using a variety of tools. Um, 
And there's also a range of automated edits that can be done um, with, within GFE itself. Then these forecasts basically flow on and, and drive all the forecast products um, pretty much in Australia. So from um, the weather app, um, downstream users may be using the, the grids to make their own decisions. Um, and then also on our website. So with the development of, of GFE, once we had it up and running, we needed to start answering the following questions. We wanted to understand what role the operational meteorologists would play in, in the forecast production process, um, particularly with, um, I guess, automated guidance getting better and better over time. We also needed to be able to understand the quality of the Bureau's forecasts and we wanted to understand how we could improve the accuracy of these forecasts while also streamlining the forecast process. So at the time, the verification tool needed to ideally be focused around GFE verification. Uh, we wanted it to provide easy access to data for all staff to be able to uh, use this tool. Uh, we needed to be able to quickly implement our own metrics and we wanted to be able to use it in a data analysis environment such as a Jupyter Notebook and ideally we wanted it to be a Python package since um, at the time this was being developed, it was within the GFE science team and they're all Python developers. So it made sense to, to um, build this system in Python. So um, back in 2015, um, the Bureau started um, development on, on the drive verification system. It started out really small and um, has continued to grow over, over the last few years. So a bit of background as to how how Jive is, is set up. So it's now an official operational production Python-based verification system that we're running, and it's based around X-Array. And so X-Array allows us to do n-dimensional verification, so that can be both um, point-based data or gridded data, and it allows us to do that in, in memory, and that avoids um, being slowed down by reading and writing. Um, and also allows um, people to use it in an interactive way in, in Jupyter Notebooks easily. Um, but if your data is too big to, to um, be stored in memory, it does uh, scale to work with larger gridded data using Dask, which allows parallel computations. And the focus of um, this verification software um, is that it's really the metrics and everything have been focused on verifying post post forecasts. So um, forecasts that effectively come out of a predictive distribution or, or, or a categorical forecast um, rather than NW, like deterministic physical NWP models. So the focus has really been single valued forecasts, which are just forecasts that are taken from a single point within a predictive distribution, categorical forecasts and probabilistic forecasts. And so this diagram kind of describes the layout of, of, of Jive, how we've set it up in the Bureau. So um, from the, the Bureau's various databases, um, we take um, point-based data, gridded observation data, um, spatial warning data, and um, both point and gridded official automated and NWP forecasts that have come out of the GFE. Um, we then have to do some quality control on the observations um, and we do some processing to ensure that the observations meet our service definitions. So for example, um, we forecast 10 minute mean winds. Um, we have to derive that them from the one minute data and we also derive um, other parameters such as fire weather indexes. Um, we then actually take um, forecasts from, from private weather companies um, we make them anonymous, so we don't actually know which, which company they are, but we ingest that into, into our system, um, into, into our database, so we can compare how the Bureau is um, performing compared to, to the private industry. And really, um, there's several Python libraries that work together and they, they glue everything together. Um, so one of the core bits of the, of the science um, of, of the Python libraries that I've been involved in has, has been the metrics. So the metrics um, are really focused on categorical forecasts, uh, verifying single value forecasts, probabilistic forecasts of binary events and predictive distributions. We haven't um, 
because we haven't uh, used this tool really on uh, deter deterministic NWP models, um, there's no spatial or object-based um, metrics in Java. Um, and then we also have other tools like um, confident, like methods to generate confidence intervals and other um, processing tools. So there's a few um, ways that people can um, use Jive. Um, basically, there's three main ways uh, through verification dashboards that we've set up. Um, people can install the Python package on their own um, Linux computers, and then um, that allows them to, to connect to our databases and, and uh, use our verification metrics library. Um, and then people can also access our Jupyter Hub server. So I want to move through some examples of um, some of the impact just doing verification on, on our official forecast has had. So some of the initial dashboards we created were these evidence targeted automation dashboards. And they were verification dashboards to um, show the difference in the accuracy, behavior, and value of forecasts issued by the meteorologists, the official forecast, compared to the automated guidance, which we call auto forecast. Um, and on the right here, um, so one of my colleagues is, is really interested in um, AI-generated art. I, I um, asked it to um, describe, a, a, draw a picture of um, a meteorologist battling an automated system to, to who could produce the most accurate forecast. So um, one of the first, um, I guess, bits of verification we did was looking at um, temperature verification. So at the time, um, there wasn't really, there, there was no verification available to the meteorologists at the time. So they, to um, basically compare the automated forecasts against what they were producing. So I was based in the Northern Territory office at the time um, and um, did, did some calculations around um, the temperature forecasts. And what you can see here is that um, the automated forecasts um, were performing um, much, much better. So the meteorologists were actually um, starting with the automated guidance and making, making it worse. Um, but move forward a few years um, after we provided this, this, these verification results to the meteorologists and operational forecasters, um, you can see that uh, the, the official forecasts largely match the automated forecasts um, when you score them based on, on the MSE. And that's because they were um, relying on the automated guidance most of the time and only intervening in, um, with the grid editing techniques in, in a limited amount of situations. And this um, nicely improved um, the forecast. Um, so or the, we wanted to, the forecasters said that, um, you know, like the, the verification scores, if we're just looking across the whole season would wash out kind of performance around extremes. So um, here we've got an example of the 2019, 2020, 20, um, summer, which was a, an extremely hot summer across Australia. Um, and you can see with the maximum temperature forecast, um, they're, they're really quite close together. Um, so my colleague, uh, Rob Taggart, um, recently uh, published a, a paper which shows some methods that you can um, evaluate point forecasts for extreme events um, using consistent scoring functions. So. What I'm showing here is a threshold weighted MSE. Um, and it's basically um, weighted on, on decision thresholds above the 97th percentile climatological value at each automatic weather station across Australia. And this is really nice because um, it, it has um, highlighted that in the short term, the meteorologists were actually Im imp improving the accuracy of the temperature forecast when it came to, to forecasting more extreme temperatures. Um, we've also used um, the, the, the verification results on the dashboards to inform the development of automated tools within GFE. So some of the initial wind speed verification results um, at the time was just the old automated, which is the blue line against the um, official um, automated, the, the, the official forecast, um, which is the green line. And you can see that lower scores are better. So the official forecasts were doing far better with wind speed forecast around exposed mountainous peaks. 
So we spoke to the meteorologists and asked um, them what their forecasting technique was. Um, we then kind of mimicked their process and ran some hindcast experiments with GFE um, connected um, with, with Jive. And you can see that the new automated forecasts um, when we ran this hindcast experiment um, performed fairly similar to the meteorologists across um, the first four lead days and then better at the longer lead days. Um, so we were able to um, implement uh, this, this automated process in production, um, which saved the meteorologist um, a lot of time on shift and also um, significantly improved um, the accuracy of the automated guidance. Um, one interesting um, finding that, that, that came out of doing verification, which we didn't really think about when we first started doing doing it is that it really forecasts, it really forced us to clarify what we're actually um, forecasting. Um, how do we define the forecast? So the wind speed um, verification highlighted attention. So the automated forecasts were forecasting the only hour wind speeds, whereas the meteorologists um, were biasing up the forecast because they wanted to forecast the maximum in hour wind speeds, um, which may have been more useful for say, marine wind warnings or um, like a severe fire weather day. So um, we managed to resolve this tension by we ended up introducing the two wind speed forecast um, parameters because different users need um, different wind speed forecasts. Some need the only hour winds, some need the maximum within the hour winds. Um, within Jive, we um, built some nice tools to be able to statistically convert between those two wind speed parameters. We then did some hindcast verification experiments in Jive, and you can see these results on the right on, on the plot there, where I'm showing the, the maximum wind in hour um, forecast verification results. And you can see that the new automated guidance um, when, when we apply these statistical corrections was better than the um, just the on the hour automated winds as you'd expect, but also better than what the, the meteorologists were, were producing. So we implemented this into production. Um, so these tools made their way into GFE. So they run in an automated way, but the forecasters can also um, edit the win, one wind grid and then um, use this tool to convert back to the other, convert um, the forecast for the other wind speed grid. Um, our dashboards, just by providing verification results, um, the forecasters were able to see where there were, there were biases over different parts of the country. So these are for the wind on our forecasts over the southwest of Western Australia. And you can see by the multiplicative bias on the top plot that um, there's, there's a strong under forecast bias um, in the automated forecast. So because it takes a while to get um, fixes into production with the automated guidance, what the meteorologists started doing was simply dividing the automated guidance by roughly 0.85 to just do a simple bias correction. And that led to an improved, um, um, improved wind speed forecast going out to the public. So some other dashboards um, that we've built and have been working on are these forecaster dashboards um, that, that are based off of Jive and um, here I'm showing an example where a, um, where a user has just selected a period of a week back in December. Uh, they're looking at um, the maximum temperature and they're basically looking at the, the mean difference from observed. So, so the bias in the forecast. So they're able to um, look at areas where their forecasts have been, um, the red areas indicate where the forecasts have been too warm over the week and the blue areas highlight um, where the forecasts have been um, too, too cold over the last week. So these dashboards um, have been designed purely for the, for the meteorologists to um, really dig into the data. And there's lots of different um, metrics and um, ways to, to visualize the data. And they've um, found these really useful. And these, are also, these dashboards are also really useful for doing kind of a, a post event review um, or if people just need some, some quick verification results for um, 
a small set of dates, um, they can just put in their custom dates and, and, and get their verification results. So the other way that um, Bureau staff can uh, use Jive is through our Jupyter Hub server. So this basically the way we've set it up is that um, we've got a server that um, any staff member in our organization can access and use Jupyter Notebooks um, with Jive. So this allows them to, it provides them with the Python data analysis environment with all the, with access to all our forecast and observation data that's within the Jive database. And you can also query other um, databases within the Bureau if, if you wanna do some, um, if, if you wanna use that data. And so these are really great for um, case studies, research, developing new metrics or um, creating new GFE grid editing strategies. So um, over 350 people um, in, in our organization um, have logged on and, and used our Jupyter Hub server. Not all of those are um, you know, regular users, but um, many of the forecasters are regularly using it and um, doing verification um, to, to really try and in, in, in make evidence-based decisions around how they can um, use GFE. So an example of what, what this might look like, um, I've just given this, um, given a, a really simple example to, to map out how you might wanna um, calculate the MSE um, on, on a month of data in a, in a Jupyter notebook. Um, so that top box, um, here, we're just importing um, var various um, Jive functions and, and methods. And then we can also Im import um, all different um, um, Python, Python libraries. So I'm just importing um, a visualization library, but um, we basically try to provide um, everyone in the organization with um, access to as many different Python libraries as possible ranging from machine learning libraries to um, visualization libraries. Um, so the next um, box down, what I'm doing here is I'm basically just getting a list of all the station numbers um, in, in Australia. Um, and um, I've put in our start and end dates. The next box down shows how um, we use um, like a, a, a wrapper function to be able to to re retrieve our forecast data. So this will come out in um, a data array with um, the dimensions, station number, valid time, and lead time. So it's a three-dimensional labeled array there. Um, then I just want to select seven lead days. Then the next box down, um, I pull out some observations for the same time period. I then, after that, calculate just a simple um, mean squared error based on the forecast and observation data. And um, what I'm doing here is that I'm um, preserving the lead day, um, the lead day uh, dimension and aggregating across all the other dimensions. And then I'm just gonna create um, a plot. And so that's what the plot looks like. Um, so this will be an, an interactive plot um, that, um, people can kind of hover over and get information or they can um, save this image um, to, to disk. So that's kind of um, like an extremely basic, simple example of how a Jupyter notebook um, looks. One really nice example um, of kind of working with the forecasters with, with these Jupyter notebooks is um, we found that with the chance of rainfall forecast with the automated guidance, there were some um, there were some calibration issues. So what I did was I copied the code from a GFE tool into a Jupyter notebook. Um, I took our data in Jive and for all of Australia solved for um, the optimal settings that you would use in this um, verification tool to minimize um, the BRAS score. And so um, I, I just shared the link to this notebook with um, our forecasters. They took it and then they started modifying it and um, running it over different parts of Australia um, because um, they knew that the, the biases um, in the automated guns were slightly different over different parts of Australia. So here's an example of um, them using these optimal settings in, in, in GFE. Um, 
for inland Australia. And you can see the reliability diagram on the left-hand side. Um, they've nicely calibrated um, the official forecasts closer to that diagonal line, um, which has led to a nice improvement in the skill of the chance of rainfall forecasts. So one other thing to, to highlight is um, we've um, created several new verification metrics as part of this Jive verification project. Um, so here's a, um, a few of them that have been published um, that may be that the wider community may be interested in. Um, so the first one looks at um, consistent scoring functions or proper verification scores for the evaluation of extreme events. Um, we've also um, just recently published a paper on our framework and verification scoring methods for, um, for multi-categorical forecasts based on fixed risk measures. And then the um, last two papers are looking at um, measuring how much uh, models or, or forecasts flip-flop between um, model forecast runs. Um, so the first paper um, is for, for non-directional forecasts and then the, the second uh, paper is looking at things like wind direction. So um, going forward, the Bureau is, is committed to using both Jive and MEC Plus. Um, they have different strengths and I, th I think they complement each other. Um, we still need to, to work through how we can best utilize both of these tools and you know what the relationship between the two of them is in the future. But to kind of give an overview of just um, some of the differences, there's, there's many more differences than I'm listing. But um, with the original focus, MET Plus was um, really designed around NWP verification, whereas Jive was the focus was more um, around um, verifying forecast services um, coming out of uh, GFE. One of the strengths of MET Plus is that um, it's got some really amazing capability with um, spatial object-based metrics, um, which Jive doesn't. For MET Plus, um, the gridded data has to be CF compliant, whereas with Jive, it's optional. You can just throw n-dimensional data at it. Um, the actual underlying code for the metrics for MET Plus C is in C++, while in Java it's in Python. MET Plus, you can't have a 100% in-memory workflow um, yet, um, whereas um, Java you can. And MET Plus is also widely internationally used, which makes it really nice for forecast centers to be able to do direct comparisons between um, the, the, the skill and, and accuracy of, of their NWP models. So to conclude um, with part one, um, the, the knowledge and the results from, from, our, from Jive verification um, has pretty much just added um, one to two lead days of uh, predictive skill to all of our official forecasts going out. And um, I think that's pretty great since, um, you know, like the, the skill of NWP um, but roughly increases at um, one lead day per, per decade. So um, we're, we're really happy with um, how people have used Jive and, and the results. And this has mainly been achieved um, through providing evidence around automation decisions. It's forced us to actually clarify how we define the forecast and what we're actually forecasting. Um, it's informed forecasting strategies by the meteorologists that are actually evidence-based. Um, and it's supported the development of, of automated tools. So um, we're hoping going forward that both Jive and MetPlus really complement each other at, at the Bureau. Um, later this year, we um, do plan on breaking out the Met Jive metrics component um, out, of, out of Jive so we can make that open source um, to the public. And um, I presented on Jive at AMS. So I've written up an, um, an extended abstract if you're interested in um, reading more about Jive. So I might pass um, pause there and see if there's any questions before I start part two. So for me to see the questions, do I need to join Slido?
I don't see any questions so far, Nick. Okay. Well, maybe I'll continue on and then um, I can take um, questions at the end um, of part two. So part two is around using um, our new- I'm sorry, Nick, you'll have to share your screen again. Oh, no worries. Yep. Okay, can you see that now? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Yep, so this next part is around um, a new verification metric that looks at um, verifying multi-categorical forecasts and how I've applied this to the Bureau's heatwave warning service. So a bit of background on, the, um, on heat waves in and, and and Australia. Well, more lives have been lost to heat waves in Australia compared to any other natural hazard. Um, so these forecasts and warnings are really important um, that, that they're really accurate. We've had a heat wave forecast service for several years now, um, but we've introduced a new um, heat wave service for this season. And the warning service is back based on the excess heat factor severity forecasts. And to give you an overview of how these are just calculated, um, it's an index that um, takes the three day mean temperature and compares that to climatology and also um, compares the, th um, the, the three day significance compared to the last 30 days because people acclimatize to heat. And then for the EHF severe, um, we take um, the ratio between the EHF and the climatological 85th percentile EHF value at each uh, grid point around Australia. So as I mentioned, the heat waves are based on, on a three day period. And um, from, from the EHF uh, severe values, we can then derive categories from these. Um, and on the right, um, there's a map of uh, Northeastern Australia and a map of a heat wave forecast with the various categories. Now with the new warning service, the way it works is that um, a warning is issued for a particular district if the 90th percentile EHF severe value, so that's the 90th percentile value spatially within that particular district, if it's severe or extreme. So we basically end up with three categories, no warning, a severe heat wave warning, or an extreme heat wave warning. Um, with the data we're using, we're using um, two seasons worth of data, um, gridded data around Australia. Um, and here, this diagram shows how, how the warnings are produced. So because they're a three day period, the lead day zero and lead day one warnings actually have observation data in them. And then the lead day two and three warnings are just purely forecast data. And they're based on the forecasts that um, come out of um, the GFE. And our verification truth is just the, the three-day period of um, the Bureau's gridded observations. Um, and there are, um, there are um, forecasts for these periods that go out beyond lead day three, but they're only um, provided to um, the health sector and emergency services. So there's a few things that we have to think about when, for, with, when producing any warning service. And there's the question of when do I issue a, a warning? So that could be you know, when a, a meteorologist issues the warning or how you do, um, create your um, automated um, warning service to, to produce the warning. And so we, we need to um, define what our risk tolerance is. And then connected to this, um, we want to be able to um, verify our warning service in a consistent way to our risk tolerance. So this diagram um, shows an example of the, like a range of what that 90th percentile value within um, that, that forecast district could be. So um, before the event happens, that there's a range of outcomes that could occur. And so if you were to forecast the 50th percentile or the median from your predictive distribution, that value would be less than one. And that means we wouldn't issue a warning. 
if we were going to forecast the 90th percentile of our predictive distribution, then that value would be above one and we would issue a warning. So we need um, our risk tolerance clearly defined. So when we went about um, verifying this, um, ran into a bit of a problem um, with some of the other uh, multi-categorical multi -categorical verification scores, such as the, the Garrity score. And that's that these verification scores aren't consistent with our heatwave warning service. Um, so these scores are, are generally equitable scores, and this means that they're not tied to a fixed risk. So it turns out that instead, the optimal probability to, to optimize uh, this ver these other verification metrics is uh, related to the sample base rate. So how often um, the event occurs within your, your data set. Um, so for example, for just the, to keep it simple, for the two category Garrity score, um, for fairly rare events such as a heat wave, which may occur say 3% of the time, that would mean you'd issue a warning every time that there's at least a 3% chance of the event occurring if you want to optimize your verification score. And that's going to lead to a huge amount of false alarms, which really isn't ideal. The other thing is because these other scores, your, your, your forecast strategy is tied to the sample base rate. Your, um, your sample of data changes as the season progresses. And that means that the optimal probability to issue a warning on will change during the season, depending on what's happened. So in contrast, um, we've developed um, the firm score, which provides a, a consistent or proper scoring function for our multi-categorical heatwave warning service. And it's tied to a user's risk threshold. So within this framework, um, you need to specify um, a few things up front. You need to, to define your categorical thresholds. So these are basically the boundaries between our categories. Um, you then can assign weights for each threshold. Um, so these, so for the first threshold, we're assigning a weight of two, and this is how heavily um, how heavily we want to to to, to penalise um, incorrect forecasts around that decision threshold. So the first threshold is uh, the no warning and severe warning decision threshold. Um, and the second one is the severe warning and extreme warning decision threshold. And so um, we care more about accurately at least getting a warning out um, versus did we get the correct category um, of, of our warnings that we're out. So the other thing that we have to specify is the risk parameter. So this is the cost of a miss relative to a false alarm. It's the equivalent to specifying the probabilistic decision point. So um, with the heat wave warning service, we were told that the service directive is that misses and false alarms should be penalized equally. So in this case, alpha equals 0 0.5, or in other words, your optimal strategy is issue a warning whenever there's at least a 50% chance of the event occurring. Uh, within this framework, we, there's also the ability to discount the penalty of near misses and near false alarms, but we're not using it in this setup. So just to recap, we have our two categorical thresholds. We have our corresponding weights for how heavily we want to penalize um, incorrect um, forecasts or warnings around these thresholds. We have our risk parameter and we're not using our, um, we're not um, discounting um, near misses and near false alarms. So the scoring functions um, are, are fairly simple for the two category case. Penalty for a false alarm is one minus alpha. The penalty for a miss is alpha. For hits and correct um, negatives, you don't get a penalty. Then for multiple categories, um, we simply sum up that scoring function up the top and we have our WI weighting term to weight them. So the way it works is that a score closer to zero is better, similar to a mean squared error. So to illustrate how our scoring matrix works, um, if we along the diagonal, if we forecast the correct category, you don't get a penalty. If we were to forecast extreme and we observe a se severe conditions, then we get a penalty of 0 
if we were to forecast severe and observe um, no or low heat wave conditions, then we get a penalty of one because of that WI term. So it's weighted twice as much. And then if we're out by two categories, so if we were to forecast extreme and observe no heat wave conditions, then we get a penalty of 1.5 as, as we're summing up um, the, the two penalties. So um, here's some, some results for across uh, two years where I've just um, aggregated the, re the, the results across um, all valid times um, and, and all districts. And uh, you can see here that, um, that there is um, skill based on the firm score um, across all lead days compared to a climatological reference, which is just the same as never issuing a, a warning. Um, and the other thing with the firm score is that we can um, decompose our score into over forecast and under forecast penalties to understand a bit more about um, the biases of, of, of the warning service. Um, we can then um, also convert it into a skill score. Um, so our reference here is um, just if we didn't have a warning service and no warnings were going out, we can see at lead day zero, um, the skills um, really quite good. So perfect um, forecasts uh, um, get a value of one and then negative values indicate that there's no skill. And um, as you'd expect at lead day zero, um, the, the scores are, are quite good. And that's because um, there's observation data that's part of that three day period. But as we step forward, we can see that um, skill starts to really um, start decreasing over Northern Australia, which is uh, the, the, the tropics. And so um, you might be wondering why performance is poor over the tropics. Well, this verification I think has, has highlighted a, a few reasons why. So the first is with that heat wave index, that's being used is that it's relative to the climatological 85th percentile value. And that means that you only need a small temperature anomaly or perturbation in the tropics to trigger the severe threshold as um, temperatures don't vary as much in the tropics. And then that's compounded by a few other issues. So across Northwest Australia, it has poor weather station coverage, which means we have a poor grid analysis. Uh, the units for our index that we're using a squared, and that means that it's harder to forecast extremes accurately as the index starts to kind of blow up towards extremes. And then we're also using a different gridded observation data set to train or calibrate the forecast system compared to what is used um, for the truth for verification. Um, and this may um, lead to, to bias forecast compared to the verification truth. So, um, starting to play around with some ideas of, um, of ways to, to bias correct the forecast. Um, so I've got, we've got two years of data to play around with. I've just taken the first year here and um, I've done some isotonic regression. And so isotonic regression allows you to um, target, say um, a quantile or, or, or an expectile. Um, so here um, we're just targeting um, like a 50th percentile forecast or minimizing say like mean absolute error. Um, and then what I've done is using this regression function, just run it for the, the same district on the following year. And what you can see here, um, the difference between before and after bias correction. So it's really brought, um, brought in these, these outliers here um, much closer. Um, and then if we repeat that and then um, aggregate the, the firm scores with the bias corrected results, um, you can see that it generally does improve um, the forecasts more at longer lead times when we have, you know, just pure forecast data, whereas at lead day zero and one, um, there is observation data um, part, part of it, part, as part of the warnings. So, um, to conclude in part two, the firm framework that I've introduced allows you to design and, and, and tie your warning service to a user's risk threshold. Um, the firm score is a consistent or, or, or a proper scoring function for multi-categorical forecasts and warnings. 
uh, the results with our heat wave verification um, show that our warning performance is worse over Northern Australia. And um, I think there's many opportunities to, to start improving the warning service through post-processing with, with conditional bias correction. And I think this is um, really worth um, spending the time on um, since heat waves have such a, a big impact on, on people's lives in Australia. So if you're interested in um, the paper around um, the, the firm score and the firm framework, um, there's um, a link in that QR code or you can um, just search for it. So that's all I have to present and I'm happy to take any um, questions. Yeah, actually, um, there were questions, uh, Nick, that came in after your first part. It just they hadn't been um, approved. So maybe we'll go back and, and start from um, the questions about Jive. Yeah, and sure. then um, go from there. So um, I actually one that is not um, visible um, from Mike Eck, um, I, I believe was the first one, or maybe Jeff's was the first one to come in. Um, so I guess maybe go down this list and, uh, oh, okay. So yeah, from Mike, do you have land focused metrics? Um, sure, so um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by land focused metrics, but um, I mean, all, all the data of those results that I showed was um, taken from observations over land. We do have other data like boy data. Um, Maybe someone could explain what you mean by land focused. Um, being this is coming from Mike, I'm, I'm guessing it's um, kind of more focused on land surface modeling, um, and so soil moisture and and you know and soil temperature and and you know things that um, and metrics that are used to evaluate how well um, the LSM is performing. Sure, no, um, we we haven't um, used it to evaluate any any land service land surface um, forecasts. But um, yeah, um, I don't know too much about land surface um, forecasting, so um, I'm I'm not sure if there's there's an overlap between um, the metrics you use and and what we're using. But there's probably some overlap at least, but maybe okay. not all. Okay. Um, so then uh, the next one's from Jeff Duda. Um, if the verification is done ent entirely in memory. How long um, do some of the post-process forecast input files remain open or used um, by the code? Sure. Um, so it'll basically just be um, come down to how, how Python handles the, the in-memory um, data. So, um, you know, if someone's got a Jupyter notebook open, um, it will probably stay um, in memory until that Jupyter notebook um, is shut down. Otherwise, if we run like our weekly verification runs, then um, when it's not needed, um, it's, it's, it's removed from memory. So that's all just handled um, by Python itself. We don't really need to think about that at all in, in the way that we've designed Jive. Okay. Um, moving on to the next question from Dave Turner. Um, the, once again, this is um, still focused on Jive. Um, he does have a question about the um, the heat wave index um, presentation as well. But um, for Jive, you indicated early on that Jive uses databases. Would you be able to describe how the Bureau uses databases for storing model and or observations? Yep, sure. So um, with the with the Jive database, it's a, a Postgres database. Um, the, the data that we have freely available to, for people to use in Jive is basically a subset of, you know, all the Bureau's data. We don't um, kind of replicate all that data. But so, um, yeah, it's, it's in a Postgres database, both um, point-based and um, gridded data. And then we have um, Python wrappers built into Jive, which then go and um, call call the, the Postgres database. Yeah, and um, if I recall during our discussions yesterday, the um, you, you did mention Couchbase is something that um, you, you find to be somewhat interesting and, and you may want to um, 
explore as well. And I know the GSL is doing a lot of work in that area. So maybe um, you will be discussing that further today, later today. Yep, sure. Yep, that's something that we're, we're looking into. Great. Okay, next question from Lisa Bernadette. Um, would you say, and once again, this is about Jive, um, would you say that forecasters add value over AI for more extreme events and variables? Yeah, so um, in, in many cases, um, our results have showed, yes, they do, not, not all the time. Um, an example is um, with the, the flooding um, over Eastern Australia last year. So there was um, severe, there were several severe flooding events across Australia um, on, on the Eastern side. Um, and the results showed that um, the meteorologists were generally doing um, better the majority of the time um, with, with heavy rainfall forecasts. Um, so that was nice to see. We've seen with um, temperature um, that um, the forecasters do, do add more value as well. With wind speed, it's uh, it's not so clear that they are actually adding value with um, more extreme wind. Okay. Um, so there's more questions rolling in. Um, I'm actually going to group them because there's still a couple questions about Jive, and then we'll um, switch over to um, talking about the the heat wave and firm um, metric and, and so forth. So Lin Lin Pan um, is asking, how do you do the QC in Jive? Yeah, sure. So um, most of the QC, so there's a, a few different ways. So uh, our, when we take our gridded observations, we're relying on the QC that's done upstream. The main QC that we do is on our point-based um, observations from weather stations. So um, there is some initial um, QC that's done by the climate people. Uh, we take that, but we don't find that that's good enough. And then um, basically we go through the one minute data and we've built a whole lot of um, algorithms to, to basically look for, for, for known problems or, or spurious values sort of crept through and um, remove them. I know that um, someone in our team is um, interested in exploring um, some machine learning approaches approaches in the future to QC, um, but we haven't tried that out yet. Okay, thank you. Um, and then from Matt Wandischen, um, uh, once again about Jive, was it difficult to get the forecasters to buy into it and improve their forecasts? Oh yeah, great, great question. Um, so. Um, it took it took a lot of effort and s several years of convincing um, them. Um, so initially, you know, they they love verification they love verification results whenever they show that they're beating the automated forecasts. However, mm -hmm. um, as as soon as um, you show that the automated forecasts are better, then they'll start you know being really skeptical of, of the verification methods and, and everything that's being done. So um, it, it took um, a couple of years um, to start getting them on board. And um, some things that helped was at that time, we had basically a, a different forecast center in each capital city. Um, the forecast centers that moved ahead were um, ones that kind of had a verification specialist working in that center that who would who would work directly with the forecasters to explain um, the verification results. Um, other things that we've done is that um, the use of the Jupyter notebooks allowed the forecasters to do their own verification, so they were able to do it themselves, um, which was nice because then they were able to uh, trust it more. Um, and the other thing to note is um, with the dashboards that we made that were to inform decisions around automation, we, we made this plot explainer tool, which takes in the selections that a user clicks on and then gives a custom, like a, a display exactly what they've um, selected in the metrics and explains to them how to interpret the plot and how the verification is done. Um, because we found, you know, 
not all forecasts is a, a verification expert. So we wanted to help um, them correctly interpret the forecast. And we also wanted to ensure that um, managers were um, correctly interpreting um, our verification dashboards um, since they were making decisions around automation. Okay. Thank you. Um, so now turning um, our attention to the um, second part of the presentation about the, the heat wave index and, and firm, um, we have a question from Dave Turner. Um, you uh, saying um, he appreciated both your first and your second um, presentation. Um, in the second presentation, you showed how well the method worked for extreme temperatures. Would it also um, work for a limited range? For example, many decisions associated with um, specialty agricul agricultural crops hinge on how well we can forecast a temperature range around zero degrees um, Celsius. So. Um, can you can you yep. constrain that range of, of temperatures? Um, yep. So you, yes, you can constrain that range of temperatures to whatever you want, and you can actually weight different decision thresholds differently. So you can kind of apply like another function or like a curve to um, to, to apply your weighting um, to to how you weight um, those scores. Okay. And um, towards that end, um, the next question, which is from Matt Wandeshin again um, about weighting, is how sensitive is firm to um, to the choice of weights? Well, I guess that's up to the user to decide how how they want to use the weights. Um, you know, in in some cases, um, the you might have all the weights equally for for all decision thresholds. I guess one, the main thing to highlight is that um, kind of like the op, like if you modify the weights, your um, the way you produce the forecast in terms of your forecasting strategy doesn't change at all. You're still tied to that risk threshold. What it might change with those weights is you know if you were to um, weight it to more extremes and and um, and, and you're comparing two models, then uh, Perhaps it'll you know um, focus more on on the model that performs well around extremes, but it doesn't change your actual forecast strategy. Okay, thanks. And then one final question about firm um, from Jeremy Corner. Um, great presentation, Nick. How well do you envision firm would work with other extreme events such as tropical cyclones at assessing risk? Well, yeah, I guess uh, potentially it could be used for tropical cyclones since they're um, based on, on categories. And um, I think firm is kind of, it's really independent of, of, of what you're forecasting. So, you know, it's, it's not tied to the heat wave index or anything. It's um, basically will fit into any forecast framework where um, you've got categories and um, you've got a clear risk threshold defined of what you actually want to forecast. Okay, thanks. Um, and then just one final question that's kind of off to the side a little bit, um, once again from Mike Eck is just curious, um, you use cable and do you, do you know, do you use cable and jewels for land models? Um, is that something that you know? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. They sound familiar, but I don't know if that's because I've just seen them in the literature or if people are using them. So sorry, I can't give you a clear answer on that. No, fair enough. Okay, so um, no other questions have come up and we're almost at the top of the hour. So um, at this point, I want to say thank you, um, Nick, for this great presentation. Um, to those that are participating, um, you know, thank you for your, um, your questions. Um, Nick is going to be meeting with um, GSL scientists um, start in a little bit um, after he actually gets to NCAR um, for um, the, those um, that visit. Um, so uh, if you're with GSL and you're interested in, in um, you know hearing more, I'd suggest you reach out to either Lisa Bernardé or Dave Turner to try and um, figure out if you can um, participate in the meetings this afternoon. Um, we did uh, record our um, our discussion with Nick yesterday about Jive. Um, so uh, if um, there's someone who wants to see the demonstration that he gave for Jive um, to the NCAR um, 
uh, DTC um, Met Plus staff, um, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I will share that. And otherwise, um, round of applause for Nick. Thank you so much. And uh, enjoy um, trudging through the snow to get to NCAR. Thanks. Thanks.